two large experiments. Here's Atlas. It looks like an alien spaceship. Here is CMS. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but CMS stands for Compact Muon Solenoid. This is physics humor. Uh, I can show you the picture of a human being. So if that's compact, uh, it's compact compared to Atlas, but they're both pretty gigantically huge. And they are put together by collaborations that have over 3,000 people in each of them from many different institutions across the world. So you might have a little piece here that was built in Russia that is communicating to a piece next to it that was built in Brazil, then next to it a piece that was made in Italy and so forth. The fact that it works at all is a miracle and the, the thing that I heard most often talking to experimental particle physicists while writing my book was, if the United Nations worked as well as CERN did, there would be world peace. Uh, what the detectors do is they wait for these protons to smash together. That happens 100 million times a second. Every collision generates about one megabyte of data. If you do the math in your head very quickly, you will realize that in a few seconds, that is more data than is in any database on the Earth today. So what do you do? You throw it away. You throw away all but one out of every million collisions that are generated. You look at them very quickly. You say, that doesn't look interesting, it looks boring, and you throw it away. You can't keep all of the data, but you keep the ones that look interesting, and then you apply enormous processing power to that. The LHC does, in fact, have the largest database on Earth right now, but it's still a tiny fraction of the total data created. And then you hand it over to the experimentalists. Uh, Atlas uh, was led by Fabiola Gianotti back when they first claimed the Higgs boson discovery. She has since, in a peaceful transfer of power, handed over reins to Dave Charlton. Uh, Guido Tonelli was the boss of CMS when they first got the hint for the Higgs boson, and Joe Incandela was the one who got to announce the final discovery there. And these people lead collaborations with over 3,000 people. So an Atlas or CMS write a paper, there are over 3,000 authors on the paper. It is very often the case that the list of authors is longer than the paper. <laughs> this used to be a problem when papers were printed on paper. Nowadays, we have electrons, and it's all fine. And I like, to, I like to bring things back to Earth. The LHC is an enormous, impressive, overwhelming thing, but not every piece of it is overwhelming and enormous. Here is where the protons come from. This is about that big. This is a little canister that looks like a fire extinguisher. It's a canister of hydrogen. Okay, where do you get protons from? The hydrogen molecule is two hydrogen atoms. A hydrogen atom is one electron and one proton. So you take hydrogen molecules, you zap them with electricity until the electrons and the protons separate, and now you have protons. And all of the protons, 100 trillion at a time, zooming around the LHC, they come from this little canister. And that canister is enough to keep keep the LHC going for many billions of times the age of the universe. Protons are not the limiting factor when it comes to send money and we will keep the LHC going for billions and billions <laughs> of years. And we're gonna take these protons, these unsuspecting protons. There is, by the way, a Twitter account, LHC Proton, that you can check up on uh, the, that particular proton's thoughts as it goes around the ring. Uh, eventually, you will smash into another proton and, and new particles will come out. Here's the sad news for you would-be Higgs hunters. You will never see a Higgs boson. You can create a Higgs boson, but the Higgs boson decays. It has a very short lifetime. The lifetime is one zeptosecond, which is a really short period of time. Uh, the technology in the LHC is good enough that if something lives for one millionth of a second, you can detect that it was there. But a zeptosecond is, is less than a millionth of a millionth of a millionth. You have no chance. What you can do is you can detect what the Higgs boson decays into. So this is an event. This is not um, a simulation. This is data where you made a spray of particles, and then a couple of them stand out. This is a, pro a positron and an electron. This is a muon and an anti-muon. And this is the kind of event that you might expect if your protons had come together, made a Higgs boson, and it decayed into this electron, anti-electron, muon, anti-muon pairs. The problem is that there are other ways to make collisions that look exactly like this. So not only will you never detect a Higgs boson by sight, you will never be able to point at an event and go, oh yes, that must be a Higgs boson. There are other ways to make this event. In fact, there are more ways to make this event than by making Higgs bosons. So what do you do? 
Well, you hand it over to your theorist friends, and they predict what kinds of things might come out of the Higgs boson decaying. And again, due to the miracle of quantum mechanics, there's a pie chart. It's not a definite prediction. There are probabilities involved, sometimes quarks, sometimes gauge bosons, sometimes uh, photons, and so forth. And so you're going to look for these, this different rate of different particles being produced. But the crucial thing is, because every one event has different possible explanations, you need statistics. You need data. You need to achieve statistical significance. So sometimes people say that looking for a Higgs boson at something like the LHC is like looking for a needle in a haystack, if only it were that easy. It's hard to find a needle in a haystack, but when you find it, you know you found it. Looking for the Higgs boson is like looking for hay in a haystack. The Higgs boson says that if you took your haystack and you st stood up all the stalks and arranged them by length, there would be a slightly anomalously large number of stalks at a certain length. So you need to do very careful statistical analyses of the data, and that's why it takes time. That's why this discovery sneaks up on you. You can see that there is a little bit of a signal. You don't know if it's just a fluctuation or if it's real. You need to collect more data before you can declare victory. Victory came in July 4th, 2012. So these two plots, what are these showing you? Uh, these are the two plots that I needed to argue with my publisher over including them in my book because he said, uh, you can't include these, they're too scary. They look like science. There's numbers and data points, and no one really wants that, really. And my, my counter argument was, we paid $9 billion for these plots. We should include them in the book. <laughs> they are in the book. I won that argument. So what are these? Well, you're, what you're looking for in this particular example is two very, very high energy photons being uh, created in a collision. And because of weird particle physics ways of thinking, the units for the energy of the photon is in billions of electron volts. You don't need to know what that is. But because E equals mc squared, you can convert back from mass to energy. So what you predict is that at low energies, there's quite a few events, and they get fewer and fewer events as you get to higher and higher energies for those photons coming out. So this smooth curve, the dashed line, is the prediction that you would expect. And you see there is a bump. There's a few more events right there in the ATLAS data. There's a few more events right there in the CMS data. It is very, very important that there are two experiments looking for the same thing, getting the same answer, because you wouldn't believe necessarily just one experiment. Uh, and you also wouldn't believe that there was a bump there if they didn't draw a line that you could actually see the bump. But of course, they do the statistics. They look at this very, very carefully. There's less than a one in a million chance that those bumps just happen by accident. And especially when you add the fact that they happen in both experiments in the same data set, what that means is that you have discovered a new particle of nature, a new vibrating field with a mass of about 126 billion electron volts, about 126 times the mass of the proton, a new piece of nature exactly where we would expect the Higgs boson to be. So it took time. The, the physicists were cautious at first. They said, we have discovered a Higgs-like particle. But what does it mean to be Higgs-like? Remember that pie chart of ways to decay. You want it not just to decay into photons, but also into quarks and Z bosons and so forth. And that's what they've been checking. And just in the last month, they are, they're willing to go on record as saying, yes, the thing we have found is a Higgs boson. So what that means is that somebody is going to win the Nobel Prize for something. We don't know who, though. There's this charming but antiquated rule that the Nobel Committee has that only three or fewer people can win the Nobel Prize in any one year. You remember I had that slide of people who invented the Higgs boson idea. There were more than three people on it. So that's a problem. So my suggestion was that some person should convince the Nobel Committee to change its rules so that collaborations could win the Nobel Prize, and that that person should win the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts. <laughs> I don't know whether that will happen or not. Even better would be if the experimentalists win a Nobel Prize, but there are 3,000 experimentalists on each team. Something is going to have to give there because this discovery is absolutely worthy of Nobel level recognition. But we're not done. The Higgs boson was the one thing that we were pretty sure would be there at the LHC. That's why I made a bet with Brian Schmidt. That's why I'm here today. 
but we don't want to stop. You know, the LHC is in fact shut down a couple months ago because it's being upgraded to go at higher energies. It's gonna be shut down for two years while they uh, upgrade all of the gizmos. It's gonna come back in 2015 and start smashing things together in a regime where we have not yet looked. We want to find more particles, not just the Higgs boson. We're convinced that there are more particles to be found because there is dark matter in the universe. The dark matter that the astronomers have found is the best evidence we have that we're not done with physics. Uh, the dark matter is this stuff. This is an actual map of dark matter. This is created by, you know, you are here, and over here there are galaxies very far away, and you look at the deflection of light that travels from those galaxies to us, and with that you can figure out where the matter in the universe is. You can compare it with the ordinary matter the matter of the standard model of particle physics, and you're nowhere close. The total amount of matter in the universe is five times as much as you can possibly account for by ordinary atoms, by quarks, leptons, photons, gluons, etc. There needs to be new particle physics that we haven't yet discovered. The, dark, the existence of dark matter is the thing that keeps par particle physicists optimistic that the LHC is nowhere near done yet. We can't be sure it's possible that the dark matter is going to be inaccessible to the LHC, but it absolutely indicates there's something remaining to be found. We have ideas for what it could be. There's something called supersymmetry, an idea that if you have all the standard model particles, they each have a duplicate. They each have a heavier evil twin. So for every fermion, that is to say quarks and leptons, there's a supersymmetric partner boson, and you get its name by taking the name of the regular particle and putting an S in front. So there are quarks and squarks, leptons and sleptons, <laughs> top quarks and stop quarks, bottoms and spottoms. It's, you know, endless amusement. And then for every boson in the standard model, there is a fermionic superpartner, and you get that name by tacking eno to the end. So you get gluons, gluinos, gravitons, gravitinos, higgsinos, and so forth. So we hope that the particles we know of the standard model are only half of the particles waiting to be discovered. We haven't seen any evidence at all that supersymmetry is right, but it would be nice if it were right. It provides an excellent candidate for the dark matter. It helps us explain some puzzling features of the standard model and so forth. We're crossing our fingers that either supersymmetry or something even better is lurking right around the corner. These new theories make interesting predictions. So for example, you notice that there's not one circle here over Higgs, there are five. It turns out that if supersymmetry is right, there's not one Higgs boson. There are five Higgs boson particles. So it might be that we haven't discovered the Higgs boson. We've discovered 20% of the Higgs bosons that are out there to be discovered. We are very, very, very eager and anticipating what's gonna happen when the LHC turns back on. In the meantime though, just because we look forward doesn't mean we shouldn't celebrate where we've gotten to. We really have achieved something very, very important. Because of how quantum field theory works, we can divide up physics into different sectors, different parts of nature that talk to each other in noticeable ways. So the ordinary matter that you and I are made of is described by the standard model of particle physics. There's no room in the atoms that you are made of for any new physics to be important that we haven't yet discovered. If there was another field affecting this table or this laser pointer or your brain, if it obeyed the rules of quantum field theory, we would have found it by now. So within the realm of everyday experience, everything you've ever seen with your eyes, heard with your ears, touched with your fingers, we know what particles that stuff is made of. We are done. We have the atom, we have the Higgs field lurking in the background. We have finally, as of July 4th, 2012, achieved a consistent, clear, and correct picture of the ordinary matter of which you and I are made. We are not anywhere near done with physics. There's other matter out there that we don't understand yet, but still, in this room, we understand what the particles are. That project that was started by Democritus 2,500 years ago of understanding the matter around us, the, the stuff of the universe in terms of indivisible elementary particles, we have now have a certain region of uh, conceptual space that is under our control. We know what is going on when we look at the world immediately in front of our eyes as of July 4th last year, and that 
yet is why this has been a big deal. Thank you.